treat the target, and really the title was uh, how do we measure it, what is our target, and I've sort of just changed the title a little bit to does it matter. Uh, and I have no disclosures for this uh, talk. I have another talk tomorrow on small molecules and rheumatoid arthritis, and I'll have a disclosure slide that'll take up the whole slide. So uh, what is uh, T2T, or treat to target? And uh, there was a nice editorial in, ar in uh, arthritis and rheumatology now, uh, last year by Dan Solomon and colleagues. And basically, it's a treatment strategy in which the clinician treats the patient aggressively enough to reach and maintain explicitly specified and sequentially measured goals such as remission or low disease activity. So how do you do this? Basically, you select a target. You do a regular assessment of disease activity utilizing a validated outcome measure. Uh, you determine the appropriate uh, frequency of the evaluation, and you act on that evaluation to modify the treatment to achieve the goal. So where did this come from? Uh, and how do we get this into rheumatology? Clearly, other internal medicine disciplines have been using a treat-to-target algorithm, uh, certainly in the lipid field, uh, hypertension, and diabetes mellitus. And again, and I'll show you an editorial that sort of jump-started this in 2010 in ARD, but it's not as straightforward as, as you might believe. There's certainly in all of these disciplines, there's not a consensus on what the target should be. Uh, clearly, improving blood pressure, improving lipids does uh, improve cardiovascular risk. Diabetes, there are studies that, suggesting, uh, that suggest treating to a hemoglobin A1C are helpful and then also are harmful. So it's not a clear consensus. Uh, this is work from Scott Grund Grundy, who is at the UT Southwestern, and looking at uh, the LDL cholesterol on the x-axis uh, here and looking for every 30 uh, milligram per deciliter increase in LDL cholesterol using a logarithmic scale, there was about a 30% increase of coronary artery disease. So clearly a relationship which has been well vetted over the last uh, 30 years. Uh, they, like us, like rheumatologists, uh, frequently come out with new guidelines documents uh, that go on for pages and pages and pages. And this is uh, the most uh, recent ACC, American Heart Association, guideline for the management of blood cholesterol to reduce uh, cardiovascular risk. And this, again, is one of those busy uh, slides, which we're not going to go through. Basically talks about uh, high and moderate intensity statin therapy, uh, patients who are at risk, and what uh, you might consider doing uh, in those patients. But deep in the body of the paper, uh, there's a statement on treat to target. And uh, again, talks about how this strategy had been utilized for over 15 years, uh, but actually the current clinical trial data do not indicate what the target should be. Uh, that we don't know the magnitude of the additional risk reduction that could be achieved with one target lower than another. It does not take into account the adverse events, which we don't talk about frequently when pushing people to certain target, but the adverse events which could occur from multidrug therapy. So in this particular guidelines document, in view of the absence of data, the approach appears less useful than it might appear. So clearly we want to reduce these levels, but we don't know exactly what the target uh, should be. So this was the uh, editorial in ARD, which I uh, alluded to. Uh, treat to target, uh, moving from hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and diabetes uh, to rheumatoid arthritis. So rheumatoid arthritis actually is an ideal disease to look to try to develop a, a treat to target uh, approach. Uh, we know, and I'll show you just one set of data, and there are multiple data sets which show that disease activity is associated with reduction in quality of life and premature uh, mortality. Uh, this is data from Ed Yellen and his group at UCSF, and this is data from the 80s and 90s in the pre-biologic era. But basically, if you take patients and stratify them by their function, physical function disability, the uh, quartiles of HAC scores, you can see that patients with greater disability and poor physical functions measured by the HAC score have a uh, lower survival. The mortality risk is increased. And if we can improve uh, their physical function disability up to this area that we could prolong their survival. And we've seen this in, in, in numerous uh, long-term observational databases uh, to confirm this data. Short term, uh, there was a study from the Netherlands. A lot of this work on treat to target has come from across the pond. And again, the systems over there, certainly in the UK where you have a consulting rheumatologist who may see the patient every three to six months, otherwise managed by a family practitioner, you know, their outcomes are not what we think we have in North America, the United States. And certainly in my practice, which has been going on since 1980, if I had a patient with active rheumatoid arthritis, I'd see them as frequently as I need to see them every three to four weeks or even more, more often if I need to get them under control. 
But in the Netherlands, they have a cohort of hospitals that have come together to look at uh, targeted therapy uh, and, to look, and target DAS-28 remission, DAS less than 2.6, and they've enrolled a, a slew of patients into this database, and they looked at their one-year data in 239 patients, and they saw that they could get almost uh, two-thirds, 57 percent of patients into remission, another 16 percent into low uh, disease activity, and you can see that the majority of these patients had a HAC score less than 0 0.5, which is considered uh, one of our targets as well. So clearly, being aggressive with treatment, we can uh, improve uh, the clinical outcomes in our patients, and hopefully long term, this will translate into a reduction in uh, morbidity and mortality. So we also know that if uh, we have less joint damage and improved physical function, uh, the patients will do better, as I've stated, and that will occur if we treat our patients early and we treat them aggressively. And again, in rheumatoid arthritis, we have data that goes back as far as this data from the uh, LARD, also from the Dutch experience, uh, looking at patients seen from 1993 to 1995 who had a delay in therapy of three months after they presented to the clinic, and these were early RA patients, compared to patients from 96 to 98, also with early RA, who were treated within two weeks of presentation. And you can see the patients treated earlier had less uh, progression radiographically. This is looking at the sharp score on the y-axis, three and a half units compared to 10 units uh, with the, just a three-month delay in therapy with drugs that were not particularly that potent, hydroxychloroquine type drugs and sulfasalazine. Now, in the new era, since 1998, when the first biologics uh, were approved, uh, we now can target remission. Uh, this was never something that uh, we considered in clinic uh, previously. I started in the area of gold and penicillamine, which is hard to say. Uh, we were early adopters of methotrexate in 1980, 81. And even with methotrexate in, to, from 81 to 98, we had a third of our patients did very well, but the other two-thirds or more continued to progress, developed uh, deformities, disability, and, and inability to function in their daily activities. Certainly since 1998, it's been a lot more fun to be a rheumatologist, and we've learned that our therapies uh, can be incredibly effective and certainly more effective in the patients that we see earlier. This was the COMET trial. Paul Emery was the first author looking at methotrexate monotherapy versus combination from the get-go with uh, etanercept and methotrexate and early uh, monitor severe rheumatoid arthritis. And just to summarize, since uh, we have a short time for this talk today, 20 minutes or so, uh, clearly, uh, the combination therapy with the Tenercept plus uh, methotrexate, 50% uh, of patients at the end of 52 weeks uh, were in remission uh, compared to 28% on methotrexate monotherapy. And in addition, uh, the patients on combination therapy were much more likely to have uh, no radiographic progression over a year's period of time. We have numerous databases, such as the Premier database, which also have shown the same type of phenomenon. So it became a reality after 1998 to begin to target low disease activity and target uh, remission. We can also measure disease activity. Uh, we've always measured swollen and tender joints, and it's, uh, you know, it's funny that Artie and Jack were talking about clinical trials and not seeing patients uh, for their non-radiographic spinal arthropathies. You know, the, we always thought swollen and tender counts were the most objective measure that we have in clinical trials. And what we've learned is probably the least objective measure we have in clinical trials is as people may squeeze harder to get a patient in the trial to see if they have more tenderness. They may see more swelling that goes away when the patient's on therapy. And Vibica is in the back who's going to talk there. She and I did some work early on that actually show that patient reported outcomes, pain, uh, hack scores, and so forth, had a greater effect size compared to placebo. There was a higher placebo response rate with the swollen and tender joint counts, but most of the community that, uh, you know, is in this field looking at remission and low disease activity certainly feels keeping the swollen tender joint count in the paradigm is important. But we can look at uh, these joint counts, we can look at acute phase reactants, we can look at patient reported outcomes, and we now have validated composite measures that we can utilize to measure disease activity. I think uh, everyone in this group is familiar with uh, all of these disease me act assessment measures. We don't use the ACR responses in clinic. Uh, you know, it's, it certainly measures one point at time. It's not a dynamic measure, measuring change over time, like the DAS scores, the various var variation of disease activity scores. Um, and, uh, but again, all of these are available. You have the patient reported outcomes on the bottom. The ACR, uh, which is good at uh, setting up committees and putting together task force, 
put a task force together to evaluate uh, these various disease activity measures, and there were over 65 disease activity measures that they started with, that they evaluated, they looked at their validity, their uh, responsiveness to change, and basically came up with these elements that any disease activity measure should have. It should reflect disease activity, it should be sensitive to change, it should discriminate between low, moderate, high disease activity and remission, and it should be feasible for use in the clinic and acceptable to rheumatologists who practice in, in academic or clinical centers. So in this document, they came up with uh, six disease activity measures which they endorsed and basically said to rheumatologists, use what you choose to use, that these uh, uh, would be acceptable. And uh, you have uh, these patient-driven uh, composite tools, the, the POS, POS2, the RAPID3, which look at uh, patient global, hack scores, pain rating. You have the CDI, which I use in my clinic, which has uh, MD, joint count, patient global, uh, provider global, and remission, and, and uh, does it allow for remission criteria. You have the, the, S, the simplified disease activity index, and you have the DAS-28, which also use acute phase reactants. And uh, these have uh, uh, been shown to, to be reliable and to discriminate change. And again, in your handout, this is the back actual scoring system. Uh, how many of you rheumatologists or physician extenders uh, measure disease activity in, on your patients? So it's growing. It's growing. I'll show you a little bit of data on that later. And then finally, we have uh, the work of the ACR uh, and ULAR subcommittee that uh, came up with the definition of remission uh, for clinical trials, the Boolean uh, measurement, which is swollen and tender joint counts, patient global, CRP all less than or equal to 1, or the simplified disease activity index of less than 3.3. And for clinical practice, uh, they remove the acute phase reactant or use the clinical disease activity index. Uh, and again, these have been widely studied. You know, the rates of actual remission with combination therapy with these more stringent definitions of remission, which are much more stringent than the DAS-28, are in the ballpark with combination therapy of 15 to 20 percent and with monotherapy of about 10 percent. And unfortunately, sustained remission is often even uh, less than that. And then we do want to, you know, just mention what the impact of fibromyalgia may have on these uh, various disease activity measurements where there is a patient global uh, rating or even a joint score. This was from a, a French cohort of patients that uh, looked at the various measurements of disease activity and the individual components and looked at the impact of uh, fibromyalgia on these scores. And you can see that for the DAS-28 and the uh, SDI and CDI that uh, the scores were significantly higher for patients uh, who had uh, fibromyalgia and this was uh, driven by total joint count and the patient uh, global. So we're well aware of this. We keep trying to come up with ways to modify these questions to uh, help us ferret this out in patients who have either uh, other issues of secondary gain or have fibromyalgia. So the final point is uh, structured management with low disease activity as a target has already been demonstrated to be uh, superior to usual care. And I'll just show you a couple of examples uh, of studies, and you're these should be familiar to the majority of you. So these are several of the studies which have been looking at um, treat-to-target versus usual care, and uh, the TICORA trial I'll discuss in just a few minutes, the CAMERA trial, which was early RA, looking at uh, methotrexate with computer uh, adjustments of the dose depending on disease activity, the FINRACO study, and then Artie's already mentioned the BEST trial, and I'll just show you a couple slides on that as well, which used a DAS-44 of less than 2.4 uh, as their uh, target. So the TICORA trial was really where we first got uh, started talking about uh, uh, looking at treatment strategy and tight control. And this was a study that was conducted around the turn of the century, 98, 99, in the UK, uh, looking at uh, about 110 patients who entered the trial. And you had a routine group which was seen every three months by a rheumatologist. Uh, they were allowed to do whatever they wanted to do, any DMARD therapy at that time, inject a joint if necessary. You had the intensive group, which was seen monthly and uh, was started initially on therapy and at three months aggressively cycled through therapies to triple therapy and also received IM corticosteroids and had joints injected if the joints were swollen or active. And again, these people had about a year and a half disease, three quarters percent were rheumatoid factor positive. What's interesting is in this era of the late 90s, they already had significant radiographic disease as measured uh, by SHARP score. So this was the schematic of the tight control group, 
and this was the routine group. And again, monthly review of DAS, swollen joints injected, IM steroids given as bridge therapy during the first three months, and if after uh, three months uh, disease activity was still moderate based on the DAS-44, uh, there was structured escalation of DMARD therapy. And this is just a cartoon de depiction of what basically patients were treated with. Sulfasalazine at that time in Europe was the initial DMARD of choice. They were rapidly progressed to triple therapy in the intensive group uh, if uh, the disease activity was persistent. Uh, steroids were added, and then cyclosporin or other DMARDs could be added at a later date. So this was the bottom line. And the bottom line is that if you looked at the ULAR responses, whether it be good response or remission, or you looked at the ACR responses, uh, you could see that uh, statistically significant differences were seen between those who received, received tight control versus those who had routine uh, treatment by the rheumatologist. And again, at the time, I wasn't sure how much of this is a reflection of the way things were pra think practice was conducted in the UK, and I think a large part of that was compared to what we did in North America. But I think it's important now that we've set up these targets, these thresholds to hit, to try to push us or prod us to pay more attention to our patients to make sure that we uh, are treating them aggressively enough to allow them an option for good clinical outcomes. The cost here was really no difference between the two groups. There were less inpatient hospitalizations uh, in the intensive group, uh, and uh, although there was more outpatient uh, care provided, and that's shown here. Uh, adverse events uh, in this database uh, were no different between the two groups. Um, and actually, in most of the treat-to-target trials, the safety issues really were no different between treat-to-target and the routine treatment, except for the CAMERA trial, which intensively pushed methotrexate or cyclosporin. There were more dropouts in the intensively uh, treated group. So I already briefly showed uh, this slide from the BEST trial, which uh, is, again, is uh, uh, the 10-year tenth, tenth data uh, should be released uh, in publication very shortly. Uh, was looking at early rheumatoid arthritis, targeting a DAS-44 of less than 2.4, ma monitored every three months, and it was a strategy, strategy trial, looking at monotherapy initially, step-up therapy, step-down therapy from, triple th from steroids and sulfasalazine methotrexate, or starting with the biologic initially. Uh, uh, throughout the 10 years of the trial, many of the patients progressed to uh, combination therapy or progressed to biologics uh, plus methotrexate. And again, what it shows is that with this uh, monitoring uh, disease activity, changing your strategy, that you can get very significant improvements that are maintained in the majority of patients. This is the five-year data. I already showed you the 10-year data. Looking at the HAC score, the drug-free remission numbers were really not that different between five and, and 10 years, and about half of the patients achieved remission albeit with a little bit less radiographic progression in the patients who were treated with steroids initially uh, with, or with infliximab. And just one point that I already brought up about this 15% number of patients with remission with withdrawal therapy, Jonathan may bring it up as well, but if you go back to data from the 80s and 90s and you follow these patients and patients are taken off therapy, there are trials back then, we always seem to see 10 or 15% of patients who can maintain uh, in remission. And again, generally these are the seronegative patients or the patients who were in deep remission. So based on all of this data, uh, uh, ULAR uh, put a subcommittee together, chaired by Joseph Smolin, and uh, there were a couple, there was one couple Yanks on here, Gabowski and Keystone, but mainly our colleagues from across the pond, and wrote a paper on where do we stand with treat to target and made recommendations. And uh, this is a, a busy uh, slide, but it's in your handout. And they put overarching principles, which that, you know, treat to target should be a shared decision between the patient and the rheumatologist. The goal of treating the patient with RA is to maximize long-term health-related quality of life. Getting rid of inflammation is the most important thing, way to achieve these goals, and we should monitor disease activity. And they felt that the target should be clinical remission, except in some cases it's okay if you shoot for low disease activity. So clearly, we're faced with this decision every day in the clinic. If you see a 35-year-old patient with rheumatoid arthritis otherwise, health, otherwise healthy, you will be aggressive and try to induce remission. If you see an 82-year-old person with COPD, diabetes, congestive heart failure, you're going to be less excited about cycling through therapies and being more aggressive to try to achieve remission. And maybe therapy may be palliative, or maybe the best you can do is a low disease activity. So we have to be realistic in our expectations, but again, I think that uh, having a target to think about uh, keeps us on our toes as far as trying to be uh, aggressive and helpful for our patient.
There's actually a website, website uh, that you can go to where there's very little on the website um, that uh, came out uh, originally when uh, ULAR was behind this. And I think this had sponsorship by Pharma, which I'm not sure that sponsorship exists at this point. So really, there's not much there. But there is some education materials, both for professionals as well as their patients. So what about adherence to treat the strategy? What do we know? Do people continue to do this? So going back to the Dream Remission Induction Cohort, which is the group in the Netherlands of these six hospitals, they basically cherry-picked uh, 100 patients who were in their system and who had DAS-28 scores uh, looked at who had at least six months of follow-up. And what they found, that adherence was quite good, that the physicians were measuring, or the physician extenders were measuring disease DAS-28 in almost all the patients. 88% had DAS-28 measured every three months. And the patients not in remission, 58% had their therapy advanced. Uh, adherence to the treatment advice occurred in 70% of the patients. And as you would expect, the primary reasons for non-adherence were side effects concerns, patients wish, and the physician felt they were in clinical remission. This was an abstract from ACR looking at a, a cohort of clinical groups that have gotten together in the states and basically ask a very simple question. Do you measure disease activity? And this was the response they got. 25% did not. Uh, about 18% measured, da measured DAS-28, 20% CDI. Most common was the RAPID-3, the patient reported outcome, which Ted Pink has, has promoted to, for many years. So uh, this is growing, but certainly has been a slow uh, uh, fight to get this uh, uh, done. Now, one of the things that has accelerated our desire to measure disease activity, other than want to help our patients, was the physician quality reporting system that CMS put into place that we all have to abide by. And if you'll see here, uh, number 177 is uh, the percentage of patients 18 years and older, the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis who have an assessment and classification of their disease activity within 12 months. So it is a disease activity, it is a, one of the criteria we can use when we report to the PQRS system of CNS to achieve this threshold. They used to pay us a pittance, now they take money from us if we don't uh, meet these uh, thresholds. So uh, Solomon and his group, uh, Dan, uh, looked at the results of the various treat-to-target uh, studies that were out there. The targets have been reached by about a third, 82% of patients. More patients achieved target in the intervention cohorts than standard of care. Overall, the state safety outcomes were similar. Radiographic outcomes were improved. Intervention groups were evaluated. There was limited cost data. Basically, I showed it to you in the Tycora trial. And then their research agenda, is there one or more more effective treat-to-target strategy? Should the target always be the same, same in all patients? Is long-term treat-to-target associated with improved physical function, reduced morbidity and mortality? What about the side effects? And what are the economic costs of being more aggressive, doing more testing, and so forth in the clinic? And then, again, I uh, already showed you the algorithm for the preliminary recommendations as far as the treatment of RE therapy. In the body of that paper, they have strongly recommend using a treat-to-target therapy strategy rather than a non-targeted approach in early RA and established RA. Ideal target should be either low disease activity or remission. And then to finish up, this is uh, from RE e records, RE uh, medical records. This is not one of my better patients. I'm sorry I have to show you this here. But uh, this is my clinical diseases activity index that I have in my medical record note that I've done that day for the patient. And this is uh, one of my handful of RA patients that I've tried everything I know to do and has failed. And you can see the CDI score of 64, which is quite high. So I'll st that's a somewhat of a, a quick run through, 20-minute review of, of the field. And I'll be happy to entertain any questions if there are any.